Okay. Uh, thank you for having us. So I'm instructed to stay here. I have urgency to jump in front of the screen. I'll try to resist that, that urge. So this is joint work with Marco and Julian, who are both here. We are very grateful for the uh, money, uh, let's call it as it is, we are receiving from the Norwegian Finance Initiative. And uh, the title of the paper is Corporate Governance Through Voice and Exit, Evidence from Standard Life investments. And this study does exactly what it says on the tin. It's about standard life investments. So to give you a sense, um, how does, okay, nope. Okay, this is not, okay. So this is not moving, but this is moving. Okay, so. <laughs> we have focused recently a lot of our interest on activist hedge funds. And one problem you might say is that while activist hedge funds are terribly interesting and they have a lot of impact, they're really tiny, okay? So if you look at global assets under management for the global asset management industry, it's about 0.6%. So this is important, but you know it's not the bulk. The bulk is what is being actively managed by active asset managers. And tomorrow we may still have a paper about the passive investors and their impact on corporate governance, uh, but our paper really is, if you like, about the lion's share, so the active <laughs> asset management industry and how they interact with the firms that they own. Now, we are looking at a UK-based asset manager. Why? For um, a number of reasons, and uh, one reason Bernie a few years ago described, in, in short, uh, you know, Britain presents a model of what U.S. security markets might look if U.S. institutional holdings continue to grow and with many fewer legal barriers to institutional investor participation in corporate governance. So if you will, we're looking at the U.K., but we are really looking at global institutions and it might as well be in the United States. So Standard Life we find very interesting because it's among the largest 50 asset managers in the world. In the UK, after a recent merger, it's now the third largest. It's a mostly active manager, um, and uh, it provides to us an opportunity for a unique role, you, on the role of stewardship in active asset managers. Just to give you a sense, um, now this is really difficult uh, because they're not synchronized. So. Standard Life and Aberdeen have recently merged to form the entity that we're now analyzing. So we are talking about one of the 30 largest um, global asset managers. And while they are all complex and different and difficult to understand, one thing that we believe is important they share is that virtually all of them have what I'm calling here a centralized stewardship function where the interaction, let's say, on the corporate governance side with the portfolio firms that the asset manager holds is centralized. So we are really after the effect of this centralized governance function, okay? Now, what do we know about this? And this is a paper that we all know and we are all citing. It turns out we know very little about it. We have little direct knowledge regarding how institutional investors engage with portfolio companies as many of these interactions occur behind the scenes unless institutions publicly express their approval or disapproval of a firm's activities or management, their preferences in private engagement with portfolio firms are not observable. Now, it turns out that the institutions themselves, no surprise, don't necessarily know themselves much better what they are doing, which is one reason why they are giving us presumably access to their data. Yeah? So many in the industry seek a better understanding of their own industry. So we are trying to lift the wheel on you know, what is going on here. How do you do this? by using proprietary data, which is exactly what we're doing. So Standard Life have given us all their effectively internal data. Let me just focus you know, on one piece here. So we have the complete communications data between the portfolio firms that the asset manager owns and the centralized governance function of the asset manager. So who said you know, what, to whom, when, and as you can imagine, this is, even if it's very well structured, there's like a phone call that keep records of them? And, uh, there are phone calls in there. Yeah, we don't have the phone calls, but we have transcripts. So it's a lot of data. And we combine all this data with standard databases. And uh, quite frankly, 
when people say, you know, oh, I'm presenting preliminary work, and then over lunch you say, well, how preliminary is it? And say, yeah, it's forthcoming QJE. Ours is not forthcoming in QJE just yet, so it's really preliminary, and the reason for this is that it has taken us extremely uh, long uh, time to put all of this together. So, so you're seeing, you know, some glimpses of, of what we think, you know, will be the interesting results we can actually find. So eventually, our contribution should be to answer at least these three research questions. So first, to what extent is engagement related to fund managers trading on assets? And, you know, as an alternative view, to what extent is it related to long-term holdings and trust and commitment, which is a quite different view of governance that isn't just, you know, supporting the trading function. The second question we want to address is, can we actually lift the whale on whether exit and voice are substitutes or complements, as has been argued, or do they actually matter at all? And the third question is, does the investment performance of buy-side research, so purely internal research compared to sell-side research, relate to governance and stewardship? Now, to give you a sense of how this asset manager or how an asset manager looks like, if you held all stocks in the US and your portfolio only had turnover because of natural life and, and death situations of firms, so if you owned all firms on CRISP, your annual turnover would be about 7%. If you look at actively managed mutual funds in the US, you know it's 80 or 90% of trading, so, so there's a lot of turnover. Our asset manager at aggregate level has about 30%. And the funds themselves about 50%. So think about a holding period of two years. Neither very short term nor very long term. It's certainly not 10 years. Okay. Now, how should you think about an asset manager? This is you know, as simple as we can possibly make it. These are complex organizations, but we think they all have essentially at least these three building blocks. They are the fund managers. They are the buy-side analysts that generate research to be used by the fund managers, and there is a centralized stewardship function. Now, all of this here interacts with the portfolio company, and then, of course, the portfolio company interacts with the rest of financial markets, other analysts, and so on and so on. Now, who does what in interacting with the firm? What Standard Life do is, roughly speaking, this. The centralized stewardship function is in charge of remuneration, CSR, uh, SRI, uh, ESG, whatever you want to call it, appointing the chairman and non-executive directors. The CEO you know, is split between them and the fund managers and the analysts on the other side. So think about you know, the centralized stewardship function being on the left-hand side of the corridor. And these guys, the fund managers being on the right-hand side of the corridor, they meet once a week, yeah, at least. So they talk a lot. And the fund managers are, if you like, in charge of the big things, so delisting, rights issues, divestitures, M&A, and selling the stake that they're holding. Yeah? But there is some share of uh, who does what with respect to the firm. Now, a highly stylized process to think about, you know, how do you get from aggregated governance to actually buying or selling the stake in a firm, it would look like this, that the centralized stewardship function forms an opinion about the quality and you know, the type of governance of the firm, passes this information on to the internal analyst. The internal analyst issues in return a buy-hold-sell recommendation, which is consumed only because it's internal, so it's, it's buy side, only consumed by the fund managers, and the fund managers in turn issue themselves a buy-hold-sell decision for the stake that they're holding. Now, the analysts are frequently fund managers, and fund managers are frequently analysts inside this asset manager. So you can aggregate these three, but there's certainly a flow of information in this direction. Okay? And they talk frequently, so this is not hypothetical at all. Now, what does the centralized stewardship function actually do? So they interact with firms, and just to give you an idea of what they do, this is data aggregated at the quarterly level, so these are, you know, number of contacts that they have with all of their portfolio firms every quarter. So multiply the figure by four, and then you have basically the annual workload. So per quarter, there are between 100, 200 contacts, 
because they discuss more than one issue, so for example, compensation and a voting type of problem for the next general meeting per contact, the number of issues that they discuss per quarter is somewhere between 100 and 300. What do they mostly discuss with the target firms? More than 50% of their issues that they discuss involve compensation issues, board structure issues, and ownership and voting issues. Everything else, including uh, socially responsible investment, which is important, is less important, just by raw counts, okay? Now, an, to us, very interesting feature, which is exactly the point of having proprietary data, is that one thing that they do is they issue what they call so-called governance health warnings. Now, governance health warnings are internal flags that firms receive, so portfolio firms receive, from the stewardship function, and they receive these flags at any given time, 30 to 80 companies out of 350 to 700 UK firms that they hold are flagged in this fashion. So they observe this internally, and what might, lease, what might lead to a governance health warning being raised? Well, something related to auditing, the block holders, conflicts of interest, many of the board issues that they care about, compensation and so on. Importantly, not performance. Performance is something else. Okay, so this is the stewardship function that monitors, if you like, the quality of governance of the target firms, and if they're unhappy, they will flag a firm with a governance health warning. The firm doesn't receive this information, but the internal fund managers obviously do, okay? So an important way for us to start looking at might governance matter for exit and voice is to analyze these governance health warnings that are important events. Now, what are these governance health warning episodes, sorry, possibly related to? So what explains my dependent variable here is, you know, are you subject to a governance health warning at any given time? Just to understand the data, we're looking at here now at aggregate holdings of the asset manager across all the 100 to 200 funds that they run at any given time, aggregated at the monthly level for the entire sample period for all UK listed stocks that they own. Everything else is separate. And there are two things that are potentially interesting here. What issues or what, what, what triggers such a governance health warning? First, the fact that the stewardship function is actually talking to the firm. So voice seems to lead potentially to dissatisfaction later. So there will be a trigger for voice, obviously, in the first place. Secondly, Underperformance, underperformance in the last month or in the last year also seems to lead to or be related to no causality here yet uh, for um, a governance health warning. Now, if these are potentially important events, so these governance health warnings are potentially important events, this is event study evidence just showing you what happens to the intensity of communication around these events. Yeah, and what you see is this very strong spike in how many times the asset manager talks to the firm and how many issues they actually talk about. And afterwards, it doesn't quite fall back down to the previous level. So there is a sense of, if you think about activist hedge funds and the way they engage with the firm, there is a sense of this here, even if the setting is very different. Because an activist may own three stocks or four stocks or seven stocks at any one point in time, this is 700 stocks, right? So it's a completely different uh, level of engagement that we're talking about. Now, next building block, what about the buy side researchers? So what about the internal analysts that are producing research only for consumption by the fund managers of Standard Life itself? If you compare them, you know, just eyeballing, how do they compare with sell side research, which you are familiar with from IBIS? So, you know, what's the percentage of buy recommendations, hold recommendations, sell recommendations? What you see here very clearly after the financial crisis from 2008 onwards, the buy recommendations of Standard Life, those that are consumed internally, are substantially more hawkish. So, they are less likely, significantly less likely to be buys and they're significantly more likely to be sales. Yeah? So possibly these are more realistic 
um, analyst recommendations. And we know this from other papers that have used proprietary buy side recommendations as well. So it seems to make sense. Now, do <coughs> next step, if you like, the analysts, and remember the analysts in some cases are the fund managers, and do the fund managers, do they all listen to what the stewardship function has to say? And the answer seems to be definitely yes. So this is event study evidence that is centered on the event of a new governance health warning being switched on. And I'm restricting the data to minus 12 months before and minus 12 months after. So what you see here is as soon as the governance health warning switches on, the analysts have a vastly higher probability of selling, of issuing sell recommendations. The analysts have a vastly lower probability of issuing buy recommendations. And the aggregate stake, this is not the individual fund, but you find the same for the individual funds, but the aggregate stake of the asset manager significantly falls after the health warning. Okay, so not sure about causality just yet, but you know, the evidence is indicative that yes, analysts and fund managers are reacting to the opinions that are owned exclusively on governance, if you like, of the stewardship function, okay? So the sales increase by 44%, the buys decrease by 13%, aggregate holdings decrease by 22%, okay? Now, next building block, voting against management. So we have data for 6,925 shareholder meetings where Standard Life cast votes and uh, bothered to, to, to do so. Now, just two metrics here. First, the percentage of meetings where they vote against one or more management recommendations. 8% where they do so, they actually vote against, and 12% where they abstain. Our sense is that the abstentions are economically pretty similar to actually voting against. Yeah? So abstaining is the first step, voting against uh, is the second step, and these are fairly frequent, 12%, okay? Uh, of um, shareholder meetings. If you look at the time series, you see again that the bite you know, is getting stronger, pre-financial crisis comparing post-financial crisis. So the likelihood that you will vote against management on a particular issue that could be compensation, could be SRI, could be board structure, goes up over time. Yeah? And it goes up significantly. Now, if you decide to vote against management, uh, why would you do so? And uh, this is, the first column shows you with a dependent variable, did you actually vote against management for the entire sample? And uh, first, you're more likely to vote against management for large firms, okay, and uh, controlling for a lot of other stuff. And you're more likely, no surprise, to vote against management if the stewardship function has previously, all values are lacked here, issued one of these internal flags for bad governance, okay? Same applies for abstentions, so abstentions are meaningful. And what columns three to eight show basically is if you have voted against management, what would be the issue on which you voted against management on? And uh, keeping in mind that these are presumably votes cast directly or indirectly by the stewardship function, it should relate to their mandate and everything makes sense because the issues where they actually vote against management are related to compensation and to board, not to the other issues where the fund managers are actually in charge, okay? So the effect is concentrated on management proposals that are related to board compensation and to board composition and executive compensation, and this is perfectly in line with the standard, with the mandate of stewardship that they actually have. Yeah? So everything kind of makes sense and there seems to be impact. Now, again, event study evidence to start building the argument, does it actually matter for exit, whether you are happy or unhappy with the plan? What this is showing you is for different definitions of exit, because we're not sure you know, what exit really means. For the survey papers, it's easy to say, do you exit? And the institutional investors say yes. So we say exit could mean you sell everything, exit could mean you sell a lot, exit could mean you sell almost everything. Doesn't really seem to matter, so these are just different definitions of exit. What the red line is showing you is, is basically relative to the blue line, a diff and diff, 
what's the probability of you exiting, according to these one, two, three, four different definitions of exit, conditional on you having voted against management's proposal at one of these meetings. And what you see very clearly, what you would see in the regressions uh, that are not on the slide, you know, the probability that you actually exit after one of these votes against management significantly increases no matter how we define exit, okay? Having said this, we, after having looked at a lot of this data, think the explanation is probably more subtle. You know, why you exit and, and, and why you may want to keep the stock. After talking to fund managers, we already know that there is enormous heterogeneity between fund managers, how they think about, you know, when you should exit. Some think that, yes, if governance is, you know, bad, this is a great opportunity to sell because there will be problems down the road. Others are contrarians and believe that when the governance uh, problems arise is precisely when you should buy uh, because this will be where future alpha can be found, hopefully. Yeah? So uh, when you actually look at what other institutional investors say, it, it's not so simple. Yeah? So should we expect active owners to exit when voice fails? Tia says, no, we believe that divestment is an ineffective means of improving corporate behavior uh, by relinquishing ownership in companies we obviously lose the ability to influence them. Yeah? So the story of how you exit and why, if you're unhappy with governance, may be a lot more nuanced than, and we're just starting to scratch the surface here, okay? So final piece of evidence, and, and then I'll stop. Um, we don't have performance results yet, but we are obviously all interested in performance. So to give you a scent of what we think we are going to find going forward is, we're looking here at event study evidence of when the internal analysts change their minds. Okay, so we're looking at um, recommendation changes, buy to hold, buy to sell, hold to sell. So the downgrades and the sell to hold, sell to buy, buy to hold to buy, the upgrades in analyst opinions. And what you find here, for example, the hold to sell, which is a very strong signal, you find this very large negative and significant abnormal return around the analyst recommendation change for one month before and one month after the event. Uh, you find this even larger one here of minus 10% for a buy switching to a sell. So a cautious interpretation is that the analysts might be processing information that actually matters for generating alpha. And you know, this is very preliminary. Now, more interesting, we think is that when you split these sum samples, again, the simplest exercise I can show you is, I'm simply splitting my downgrades, let's say here, okay, into is the company at the time of the downgrade subject to one of these secret internal flags, the governance health warning? And if governance matters and helps to generate alpha, or if you like, helps to avoid losses by getting out in time, you see that yes, actually the companies that are subject to a health warning have massive negative returns. Admittedly, it's a small sample, but you know a first sense of what we may find once we dig deeper compared to those that were not subject to a governance health warning at the time that the analyst actually changed his or her view. And keep in mind, the analysts are reacting to governance health warnings and the fund managers I showed you are reacting to changes in sell and buy recommendations. Okay, so everything kind of fits together. Now, what we haven't done yet, but what we will do going forward is tell you where outcomes come into play here. So given our history of looking at uh, active um, engagements by hedge funds, you know, so what we definitely want to look at, are there changes that we can find due to the influence of the active manager you know, in compensation and acquisitions, takeovers and board changes, um, and do they matter? I can't tell you yet, but we will be able to tell you in two months. So to conclude, to what extent is the engagement, this was our first question, related to fund managers trading of assets and alternatively, you know, related to long-term holdings, trust and commitment, we are pretty sure that we see a lot of results that, you know, stewardship activity is related to trading. So this definitely matters. We do not know yet whether there is this other element that we are really interested in uh, related to trust and commitment. 
Can we say something about whether exit and voice are substitutes or complements, you know, or do they matter at all? They seem to matter a lot. Uh, so all the evidence that we have so far points in that direction. Over 50% of what the stewardship function does is related to compensation, report composition and voting. The votes against management and abstentions, which seem to be very important as well, they are significantly more likely for companies that have one of these governance health warnings. And the issues that they really care about is compensation and board composition. So we want to look at outcomes there very obviously. Probability of exit is also significantly greater for target companies where the asset manager actually abstained or voted against the firm. So clearly this matters. Third question, again, you know, starting to address it, does the investment performance of buy-side research relate to governance and stewardship? Well, internal analysts are different from sell-side analysts. That's very clear. We find these very preliminary, but you know, economically very large at normal returns, and the sell recommendations and the buy recommendations are definitely reacting to the information that is being produced by the stewardship function. Okay, so let me stop here. As I said, it's preliminary and we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, so I've been looking at corporate governance for, for a while and I'll offer opinions. Um, I like the project, um, but there are ways in which I'm going to suggest that it be repositioned. Um, I'm going to try to focus on what I'd like to see the authors do rather than um, what in, in, in a more developed paper what I dislike about what they've already done. But okay, if I don't say something about what I dislike, you all will be disappointed because you know me. Uh, so this is, a, this is a case study, and it builds on a prior study by some of the same authors of Hermes, uh, which is an activist investor in a way that Standard Life is not. I, I like both projects. Uh, you can describe Standard Life, I think, as an active money manager, but not an activist investor. And they seem to have lots of small engagements and quotes, um, but we don't get a sense from the slides of just what it is they do. All we get is counts. And what I'd like to see is a lot more thick description of what they do with some case studies, with some anecdotes. And so a question for the authors is, are there any big engagements, or is it just, you know, 200 small ones where they talk to, to, talk, talk to, uh, to, to the fund, to, uh, to, to company managers? Are there cases where they join with others to change management along the lines of the anecdotes in my old article with, um, uh, with Jack Coffey on UK activism? Does that still happen, for example, or have the standard money managers turned all that off, off to the hedge funds and all they do is vote yes or no on what the hedge funds want to do? We don't know that. I'd, I'd like to know it. I'd like to know if that quiet, you know, behind the scenes um, engagement to try to change management happens at least some of the time. Does Standard Life uh, participate in, in those efforts? Um, I want to ask a question about holding sizes. And so by international standards, Standard Life just isn't very big, right? I mean, $375 billion just doesn't rate. Uh, so they've got 49 trillion in their top 50, so this is less than 1% of the top 50. They don't tell us how much of that is equities. Um, I'd be interested in their holdings of equities relative to worldwide, maybe more importantly of equities in the UK, which is where I suspect a lot of their uh, activity uh, takes place. Are they big enough to matter? And so from a US perspective, you know, if Vanguard and, and BlackRock want to talk to you, managers should listen. doesn't mean they will. I don't know whether anyone listens if Standard Life uh, talks. And so I want to know a lot more about their position sizes, dollars, percent of firm shares. That's not in, in the slides of the backup tables right now, but that feels important to whether they could have uh, effective voice. Just are they big enough? Um, it, in the U.S., my sense would be they probably walked softly and carried a small stick. Right? They were just too small uh, to matter. Um, their voice wasn't very loud. If that's right, then their governance strategy has to reflect their degree of influence. Might be different in the UK, um, but I'd like to, to, to hear about their influence in the UK. Um, if that's right, their voice isn't very loud, they talk. Will anybody listen? Will anyone change? Maybe not. Okay, voice versus exit. If you don't have much voice, you have potential exit, which is consistent with what 
their preliminary uh, findings are, actually. Um, so let me say something about my views of the author's uh, big questions, which, uh, which Hans uh, presented. And so uh, is uh, engagement related to trading and long-term holdings and trust and commitment, and can we lift the veil on exit and voice, and um, does the investment performance relate to governance and stewardship? Um, well, maybe you should pull back a little. So I'd like to see more in the way of thick description, um, text, not, not tables and not regressions, of what standard life uh, does. Um, there's a sense in the slides of we're going to assume that other uh, institutions are similar, that was less present in the talk, but discuss standard life, not a stylized manager, discuss standard life, that's what you know. Um, then for item one, is engagement related to trading? Um, yeah, long-term holdings, maybe, we don't know that yet. I don't know what trust and commitment means here, and so I'd say pull, in, you know, pull back a little and, and pull back to what you can uh, measure more, uh, more directly. Um, number two, can you do any, say anything about exit versus voice? Not without a lot more thick description of voice, and outside the UK I suspect they're just not big enough uh, to have much voice. Um, and third, does investment performance relate to governance and stewardship? I think it's going to be really hard to get at that with monthly data, and I'll say a little bit of, more about that, uh, about that soon. Uh, okay, so toward thick description, my proposed new topic. Um, how do they staff their governance office? How many people? What are their salaries? What are their skills? And so some time ago, I wrote a skeptical review of U.S. <coughs> shareholder activism, predating hedge funds. And I said the following. A small number of American institutions, mostly public pension funds, uh, spend a trivial amount of money on overt activism. They don't conduct proxy fights. They rarely try to elect their own candidates to the board of directors. And the evidence is consistent with the proposition that the institutions achieve the effects on firm performance that what might, one might expect from this level of effort, namely not much. Uh, UK could be different, um, but I, I want to treat that as a null hypothesis. Are the UK investors or standard life doing significantly more than that? Just because they're voting centrally and they have a couple of people calling up fund managers, it may still be a relatively small, uh, small effort. Uh, something caught my eye in the tables that the, the author sent to me. So the governance warning rate really drops in 2014 and 2015. I don't know why, uh, but I think you need to think about why. Maybe the warnings just weren't that useful and so they're getting out of the business. I don't know, but it was 80, 80, 80, 90, 90, now it goes down to 60 and then to, to like 40 in the last two years where they have data. Um, so I don't know what that's telling you about what they think of their own warning system. Um, Again, more on what the governance warnings look like. What do they look like? Give us some examples. Give us some text. How long do they stay on? Or is it just, here's a warning, and then we go away? Um, how long do their internal effects persist? So we see the spike at month zero. Maybe there's something at month one, but after that, it's, you know, there, there, there's not very much. Um, how many more contacts do we see after the warning? Or is it just, you know, we, we hit you once, and then we go back to whatever we usually did? Um, and, you know, a technical comment I'll skip over. Um, what does the governance warning predict about the future? So uh, Hans showed you a slide of what factors predict the warning. Um, technical comment for probit, give us marginal effects. Once you do, there will be no difference between that and OLS, I predict. Um, the coefficients will be very close. They always are. Uh, but mostly I want to turn around and ask the question, what does the warning predict in the future and be specific about the future because right now you're a little fuzzy on that in some way. So here's some examples of some things you could look at. Um, discussions with the firm for how long, um, returns in the future, one month, three month, one year, change in governance of the firm, right? Change in standard life holdings, you've done some of that. Um, but I'll talk about why I'm not delighted about how you did it, um, how do they vote, but again, strictly in the future. Right? I don't want to see a regression of votes in the same years. I want to see a regression of what happens after the warning going forward. Um, internal analyst views, uh, we saw some of. Uh, are there any changes in external analyst views? The, the external analysts have the similar views. Um, so here, here where I was a bit frustrated with the specification. So, so your slide 18. Something happens around the governance warning. I want to know after, not around, not before, not at the same time. I want to know after. Um, the voting, right, the time period seems to be a full year, contemporaneous, again, I want to know after. Does the warning predict future votes? 
uh, technical comment on how you count the dependent variable um, that I'll leave to the authors. Um, then at the end, they relate returns to analyst recommendations, but not directly to the governance warnings. And mostly, they use a period of a month before to a month after that covers both the past and the future. And what I'd like to see is start with a warning and look forward. Forget minus one month. Minus one month could be the negative returns then could be locking the barn after the horse has escaped. Um, month zero is very hard. I think it'll be hard with only monthly data. Um, so you find governance health warnings uh, leading to trading. Again, I want to see direct, not analyst change, but governance warning. Um, how much more likely is a substantial sell-off? You have some of that, but, but I, I, I'm looking for, for more richness. Um, and I, I'd really urge you to look at the direct effect of the warning, not mediated through the analyst change in recommendation. Uh, that's assuming a particular channel, and I don't think you should or, or need to do so. Um, does governance health warning uh, lead to alpha? Again, really going to be really hard to tell with monthly data. Frankly, I'd be surprised if a couple of guys in an office looking at governance can generate alpha. Uh, governance is public information. It should be priced. Um, but if you want to get at that, you've got to show a separate returns for month minus one, month zero, plus month plus one. You can't lump them together because you're mixing up the past and the future. Uh, only month one provides clean, forward-looking uh, data. Minus one does, and month zero could reflect the price drop leads to the change in analyst recommendation, leads to the closer look at governance, so the arrow of causation is not going the, the way that, um, that you're trying to look at. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Yes. Um, one uh, on this issue of the substitute. Uh, some, some questions about this. One, uh, it seems to me the standard view is if the voice isn't successful, then you exit. But the fact that you voted no, it doesn't mean the voice is successful. For two reasons. One is you would think that the most natural would be uh, like you think that votes won't be successful, you're not going to wait until you vote again. You're just going to say the same thing before. Secondly, in some cases, shareholders vote no and then the managers respond. For example, you vote uh, on same day against managers and then they change. In which case, you would need to wait, see what the company did in response to the vote, and then you would, the prediction would be that they said not immediately after the vote, but they said six months later if you voted and the manager didn't take it into account. And lastly, you see that there will be at least one thing going in the opposite direction, namely if you're going to sell, you might be more willing to vote no because you don't care anymore about relationship in the issuance. And managers usually they say, on the margin we're likely to vote no, uh, uh, because then the compromise are ready to talk with the issuer. And this would kind of go the open direction. I, I dropped the other code because I spoke to much. I can take off here. Okay. So, it's actually more like a suggestion, but I think two suggestions I think. One is probably the most, for me, the most interesting variable is these discussions that you observe, which we don't know a lot about, what explains that, right? So that sounds like, you know, the outcome we're about to be. The other one is, because these are typically behind the scenes, it's almost like you have this laboratory where you can say, well, let's try to explain governance mechanism voice and exit, assuming that we don't observe these discussions. And let's see how much we can, you know, what changes once we can actually, you know, conditions on these discussions. Do they change any outcomes in any other way? Uh, I think you have the data to, to do something. That's okay. Let's 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 let Okay, now, 
And going back to the point that Bernie ended with about the relationship of performance and actually in your initial slides when you're talking about the governance um, flag often is a response to poor performance. Um, it does seem like that poor performance might also generate the discussion be a vehicle for gathering information and then influence the decision, do I hold on or do I sell? Is this kind of a short-term performance problem? And am I reassured when I talk with management? I think we might want to respond. Okay. Anybody like to respond? So, so maybe a quick response. I take it from your feedback, which is enormously appreciated. So first, these are important questions that need to be analyzed because we don't understand them well. This is precisely why we are doing it. Uh, the, the, we have a huge to-do list, and, and Bernie has added many points down to the list, so th thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> this is very welcome. May maybe just two quick things. One, uh, we think, but we may be too optimistic, that their voice is loud enough, because in the UK, they are not always, but frequently, the largest shareholder with a 3 to 5% stake. So let's say I you think know, you, then it, you should really focus exactly. on yeah, yeah. okay. Right? So and say um, that, exactly. it, it just wasn't clear. From and, and and second, what, what what I thought was especially interesting, let's say from the academic point of view. So we had a meeting. You know, our one you get one hour with the fund managers, yeah. and that's it. Because <coughs> they have important things to do. So we presented our work to them, and and naively I asked them, you know, what would we have to show you is the impact of governance on alpha for you to be interested in spending some time with us. And they said, give me one basis point. <laughs> one basis point is enough, then I'm interested. And, and before the basis point, there was a word that I can't repeat. But um, you know, they, they want one basis point, then they're interested. So thank you for the feedback and the comments. Okay.